Pistols are easily the biggest group of weapons in Cyberpunk 2077, and after Phantom Liberty, that list got even longer, whilst pretty much all the originals now work differently too. So it's time once again to acquire, test, compare and rank every pistol in this game before deciding once and for all which is best. Let's get to it. Down at the far, far bottom this time, below the Slaughtermatic even, is the augmented reality Raygun Supreme 9000, a toy Lexington that we're really only supposed to use during the following the river quest with River's niece and nephew. Now, there used to be a glitch where you could stash it in the boot of a car and retrieve it later, but having tried that in 2.0, I found my vehicle just despawned at the start of the VR game. Maybe it's possible if you place the vehicle elsewhere, but personally, the only way to get this one after that was with this nifty little console command. That said, this barely even constitutes the term weapon, dealing zero damage, and I mean literally no damage whatsoever, despite aggroing someone should you shoot at them. But it still consumes ammo, so that's just more annoying than anything. But it does puncture tires and smash glass, and it'll do the job if you whack someone with it a few times. Even still though, this laser tag gun is utterly useless, save for if you want to scare people utterly harmlessly. Another pretty useless gimmick gun, though one you acquire legitimately, the Budget Arms Slaughtermatic is available at select vending machines around Night City. For 100 eddies, you'll get a 36 round disposable handgun, which in very hard mode is going to struggle to take down even one enemy. And I burned through multiple before managing to defeat even one of these guys. And at about 2.8 eddies per shot, you're economically far better off using Plan B. However, as of Phantom Liberty, the Slaughtermatic now actually serves as a key ingredient ingredient at least, in building a comparatively much better gun that we'll come to in a bit. And even though it is itself not much good, it is at least a cool bit of world building, depicting a future where guns are marketed to the masses right alongside tasty snacks, literally. Before we get on to the real guns, a quick note about pistol builds and the one I used for this video. There's obviously all sorts of ways you can go with this, but I personally chucked 15 attributes into everything just so I could switch up most perks for various weapons. Each one used health buffs, air dash, cyberware, stealth, and of course the pistol tree itself. Then when using the tech weapons, I obviously bought these tech perks, and the same in the smart tree for those ones. Those buffs aren't essential, but they are useful. Then for cyberware, this layout stayed most the same. I used Chrome Compressor to experience the pistols in a more unsupported form, and importantly, Optical Camo paired with the Vanishing Act perk, which is going to be essential for the more stealth-oriented models. After that, it was pretty much just armor and health buffs to ensure survival in more intense situations, even on very hard. Now, back to weapons. So, whilst the Liberty Pistol still boasts some ridiculously strong iconics in this list, I can't help but feel like the standard edition is a bit weak, an effect that's carried over from 1.6. A more refined successor to the Unity Pistol, sure, and designed with the idea of providing precision and control whilst also maintaining freedom of aim, something taken away by the more modern smart guns. Much like a smart gun though, Liberty loses a lot of kick, exchanging it for a longer barrel to increase range and handling. It was a standout avoid gun for me personally, too weak to land one shot stealth kills on stronger foes, and it certainly can't match the accuracy of a smart gun, despite not doing enough increased damage to compromise on that ease of use. It does pave the way though for some of the best guns in the game, which we'll get to, and the crafting spec for this one can be bought from Marty Genklo at the Biotechnica petrol station, just if you're collecting crafting specs. So there's three base models of Smart Pistol in the game now, and the least interesting of those I would say is the Burst Fire Arasaka Yukimura. This gun came on the market in 2040, and far as I know, practically spearheaded the smart gun revolution. The database claims you can fire as badly as some late 20th century space opera robots, which as many pointed out from the last video, is probably in reference to the B1 battle droids, since Phantom Menace did to be fair release in 1999. Again, they're a fairly common enemy drop, although the weapon vendor in Kabuki can hit you up with a crafting spec. With 30 rounds per magazine and firing in triple bursts, it makes for a perfectly standard fire and forget weapon that you'll be constantly clicking every couple seconds. And in fairness, it does fire very fast. It's just compared to its iconic variants or other smart counterparts, it's probably the least interesting and overall powerful. That said, its common spawn rate does make it decent fodder for testing out the various weapon mods you can see on screen now. 
Much as Plan B certainly isn't nearly one of the best guns in the game for raw firepower, it can be pretty freaking useful on occasion. Formerly owned by Dexter Deshawn, Plan B fires not regular bullets, but somehow, I still don't know how, eddies. Every shot will come out of your euro dollars, not your bullets. Ever been in a fight and run out of ammo but can't craft more because you're in combat? Well, this is certainly better than nothing. Hell, it does the job just fine, though if we look at the stats, it does clearly show a base damage even lower than the regular Liberty, which I suppose we should be grateful for, given this is why V's brains weren't utterly blown out before the biochip got a chance to repair them. You can find this one on dear old Dex's body, up in the scrapyard near Raish Barnos's fridge, right where Takamura left him. The reason it ranks higher than the Liberty, despite being weaker then, is because it does have an occasional genuine use, just not something I'd ever run around with by choice, and it's kind of expensive. Trust a guy like Colonel Hansen to take a marketing gimmick like the Slautomatic and modify it into an actually fairly okay reusable handgun, even though it reminds me of that little jolt nerf thing. Best place to get the HA4 grit or the crafting spec is Herald Low from the stadium. And no, the crafted and barguest versions actually have a few differences, with the crafted generally being easier and quicker to handle, but the barguest having higher damage and better reload speed. Now, this one works similarly to the Senko LX in the since it's the most powerful when fully charged, and that takes around one second, so quick draw firing is kind of off the table. Once it is charged though, you'll have a relentless barrage of tech shots to unload. Though annoyingly, despite being labelled tech, these don't penetrate cover. And in fact, being a modified slaughtermatic, this gun still takes power mods rather than tech, which basically meant I modded it to be a fire gun rather than an EMP. It's a creative new addition for Phantom Liberty, but definitely far from the best in-house, and in fact worst I'd say as far as tech pistols go. If I were to describe Unity, I'd call it the gun of all time for Cyberpunk 2077. Indeed, this is what V pulls out during any important cutscene. It's present for various story moments, even if not definitively kept in our inventory. It is V's cannon pistol. But how does it actually fare as a pistol? Well, not great, not terrible. Perfectly average, as far as things go. Less hand cannony than Nue or Tameyura, but more so than Liberty or Lexington. Very much a starter pistol, and does fine for early game, but eventually you'll want to broaden your horizons to something a bit more interesting. Still, if you're attempting a perfectly, probably cannon run, then this is the pistol. Nay, the gun that you want. Drops all over the place, very common and entirely unremarkable. Decent enough for stealth though, whilst you hold out for the much better stealth iconic coming up later. Tamayura is a fairly more obscure hand cannon model, though I'd say one that's quite underrated. Still having no iconic variants, even with Phantom Liberty, this outlier can't be crafted anywhere, but is fairly common now across various weapon vendors, as opposed to the last pistols video where I could only find it in the Arasaka district. Lore-wise, it's one of the oldest in the game, dating back to the early 2000s, and whilst now very outdated in terms of compatibility and whatnot, it's still a pretty damn effective gun, with one of the best range and highest damages on show. In fact, the highest damage out of a non-iconic power pistol, but elsewise showing signs of age regarding its speed and handling. Indeed, this one feels clunky, for lack of a better word, and even with the immovable force cyberware and recoil reducing muzzle equipped, this gun still gives a hell of a lot of kick. And call it bad aim if you will, but I was shooting worse with this thing than several of the modern equivalents. I think it's designed this way, and honestly design is a pretty big reason to choose this gun. Otherwise, it does nothing particularly special. Still, we can change that with weapon mods, and in fairness, the high damage can make this a good single-shot stealth pistol with a decent silencer. Potentially a good early game choice for that playstyle, given revolvers can't be silenced anymore. Added in Phantom Liberty, the Militech Ticon, or Ticon, is an older model of pistol similar to the Omaha, but favoured by spies for its simplicity and reliability. You can pick up the crafting spec in Longshore stacks, and this one has two firing modes. Uncharged will do a standard triple burst of fairly weak projectiles, whereas charged shots combine the three into a single unit doing much more damage. Which is best depends largely on the situation. Depleting a vulnerability diamond is probably quicker using burst fire 
but landing precise headshots though, you possibly want to charge it. No custom sights for this one, but that's fine, because I'm a huge fan of the one it comes with. It's very spy. And if you don't own Gwent and didn't pick one specific Phantom Liberty ending, this is the only tick on you're getting. Though Gwent is free, so go redeem it. Next up, the Kenshin may not crap a pack ton of power, but it is by far one of the best handling guns in the game, with very little recoil and firing in double bursts when fully charged. Couple that with its ability to shoot through walls, and you're looking at a fantastic weapon for any mid or even closer range encounter. At longer distances, the small amount of recoil and spread is noticeable, but even there, it can still work if you don't want to switch out for something else. The mag reloads from the back of the gun, which I think looks really cool, and this is is probably one of my favourite pistol types by design. They're fairly common around NC, but the crafting spec I did find at the Wellsprings weapon vendor. Of course, there's better unique variants coming up, but as usual, regular guns do have the unique advantage of customizable mods, and the tech-specific ones there are probably some of the best. My favourite is Spine Tickler, given its ability to bestow the qualities of Yinglong onto any tech weapon. A Kenshin variant, which previously was only acquirable for those following the Corpo life path, Apparition was the gun belonging to Frank Nostra, whom we'll meet during that prologue, and then if you talk to him later on in the side quest war picks. This can be potentially looted from him, but now, even if you're not playing a Corpo, it's simply available from Herald at the stadium. If only they could give this treatment to the Rattler car too. Is it worth a buy though? Not desperately, I wouldn't say. See, Apparition, for the most part, is just a, what, burgundy skinned Kenshin? with a longer charge time and slightly more damaging charged shots, but its main abilities only kick in when the user is below about 25% health. Immediately, I had to go and remove my biomonitor since that kicks in at 35%, so with my health now near to death, I was granted a slightly higher firing speed, a barely noticeable change in reload, and in fairness, significantly better damage, which was nice for the split second I got to experience it before dying. See, health this low is a straight bullet away from death on very hard. This is why I use a biomonitor and adrenaline rush, because simply being at low health is pretty bloody dangerous, not a wise tactic for this gun, meaning all the bonuses essentially become a rare little last stand boost and in healing up you're taking that boost away. Maybe more viable on lower difficulties, but here not particularly. Still Cyberpunk's answer to the Desert Eagle, the new M is still pretty freaking strong even for just its standard model, and it looks and feels well built by design. Familiar, let's say. Very decent in a stealth build, though interestingly I would still probably pick the Tamayura there if limited to non-iconic pistols, even if this one does handle better across the board. No crafting the new air looks like, but I found plenty randomly scattered across Night City, and there's several unique looking iconics coming up regardless. However, if you want a less customized, more customizable experience, then try your luck for a good one of these across the various weapon vendors. Truly a feat of elegance and some of my favorite iron sights of any gun, even if a scope is much more viable in the dark. Catahoula is a breed of dog, which unsurprisingly makes this a Bargess weapon. These guys like their dogs. In fact, if there's one thing Dogtown is lacking, then it'd be real dogs. Oh well. Catahoula is an iconic variant of the Grit, basically with the same stats as the Bargess version, though this time allowing for a scope, if you so choose. It says there's a muzzle slot too, albeit one that muzzles don't actually go into, at least none that I had. However, it does have a special ability of increasing movement speed in accordance with kills, which itself boosts the weapon's damage, creating a nice little loop that stacks 5 times all the way up to 20% bonus speed. Pretty good for zipping about with this full auto jolt gun and nosing around various corners. And actually using this, or just the Bargast Grit, it has very much grown on me. Not the best by any means, but there's just something fun about it, and it looks cool. To acquire Catahoula specifically though, it's one of those guns you get as an Amazon Prime Twitch drop. Luckily though, if you're on PC, just install all cyber engine tweaks and input this little command here. Otherwise, just use the Bargast version. It's almost as good, but sadly doesn't look quite as cool. Oh, and if you use this one in vehicles, it doesn't need to charge up, so not a bad contender there, though there are better options. 
A big one that hasn't changed all that much in 2.0 is Kongu, the iconic Liberty variant owned by Yorinobu and looted from his bedside during the heist. As an early-ish game gun, it provides the chance to experience ricochets without needing the ballistic coprocessor. Less of a problem once you unlock two hand cyberwares, but even then, it's quite nice to not have to have that one as mandatory. That is of course if Kongu is your only power weapon, so it's actually ideal to pair alongside melee tech or smart weapons. But as of 2.0, it's no longer more beneficial to deliberately get ricochet shots, rightfully so, and instead it's just a nice passive to not have missed shots always get utterly wasted. On point headshots though are still vastly more powerful. All of this is just as well for the Kongu really, as once using it I realised it doesn't actually offer every benefit of the ballistic coprocessor. Most notably, there's a distinct lack of bullet trajectory tracking, a very useful feature when planning accurate ricochets. So yeah, it's really not a thing whereby you can aim ricochet shots without the coprocessor, making it not too dissimilar from a standard Liberty, to be honest, albeit one that has two bullets less per mag but is more accurate. And being free and easy to acquire, I would definitely use it over the regular Liberty, and hell, for the heist it's one of the only guns you're gonna have, but after that's done, you'll soon have far better things to get a hold of. I can't say why for certain, but the fully automatic nature of the Lexington has really grown on me in 2.0, and you know, I think it might be as straightforward as that satisfying ching sound that you get when landing headshots with pistols. It's a reward sound I suppose, so hearing it a lot is nice, and to be honest, the Lexington's reduction in range and base damage is more than made up for by just how many bullets it can fire in quick succession. It's erring towards the role of small SMG, I suppose, though one that benefits from an entirely different perk set. Its speed does make it possible even to use this as a rapid fire stealth weapon, though it can be riskier business than the big heavy hitters. Why would you choose the standard? Over Dying Knight, say? Two reasons. Slightly longer range and customizable mods. Trying out a standard Lexington is a great way to experience some of the different capabilities, and the best one of those with which to do that is one during Robert Wilson's shooting contest. The X-Mod 2 Lexington gets the skin of the old Dying Knight, plus some bonus range and handling. I explore it more in this video, but you may just find you prefer it over that other early game gun, Dying Knight. On top of all this, the full auto nature makes it a pretty good option for spraying out of cars, especially at lower level police hordes. Kappa is probably the most powerful of the smart guns, at least on paper, and it's the only one to fire fully automatically, which certainly helps its speed. And better still, the Kappa also offers a unique XMOD2 model, which can be found down here behind this corrugated, but only after completing the gig Spy in the Jungle. Again, these models are particularly great since they combine the upgradable nature of Iconics with the moddable nature of regulars. Plus with these ones, mods can be interchanged later. I did in the XMOD2 list place the Kappa at the bottom, though that's not at all a case of it being bad, just a symptom of everything else being so good. Kappa is great in and of itself, with just a one second lock on time noticeably faster than the Yukimura, it more than shines as a competitor in a small market, but it seems like Tsunami are still keeping their design close to the chest as these cannot be crafted. Luckily they're a fairly common find, at least by how many I picked up, and again you won't get a finer base model than the Xmod 2 one anyway, though this still isn't nearly as fun as the iconic model coming up later. If the Kenshin was the tech pistol for accuracy and precision, then the Omaha is the pistol for speed and power, boasting significantly higher damage, reload speed, a triple burst fire, and all at the expense of some reduced range and handling. Sure, this might have a small disadvantage at further distances, but honestly, the far more explosive nature more than makes up for that. You'll probably burn through more ammo and miss some more shots, but overall this should take enemies down quicker, and if you're even more willing to compromise on range and handling, the bar guest variant amps up that damage even more, whilst also increasing ammo count to 12 and firing in bursts of 4. Absolutely worth the upgrade if you ask me. But then again, you might just want to stick to the Iconics unless you're using some brilliant mod combinations, like the Iconic Wall Puncher from the Chimera Core, which reduces all damage penalties for firing through cover, transforming this into a disgustingly powerful choice for the more enclosed environments. Honestly, this thing is seriously good now, and again, if you're struggling to find one, you won't be in Dogtown, but the crafting spec is in Wellsprings. 
It may not be the best on the stat page out of the smart guns, but I will always feel a special affinity for this pistol. The Chow is just cool, like a little compact hairdryer where to reload you actually switch out the barrel. Many have pointed out that this tech is based on the Metal Storm weapon from real life, where a chamber is designed to hypercharge the projectiles contained within one by one. Very creative and very unique. The crafting spec is available at West Wind Estate, but Phantom Liberty does have a unique iconic. Now, allegedly, the way Kang Tao originally designed this one was to steal the smart targeting technology right out from under Arasaka's nose. So they stole another corpse idea and then did it better. Seriously, it feels so easy to use, not the quickest or most powerful, but far as non-iconic models go, I don't know, it just feels like one of the best, somehow. So Skippy finally became a gun we get to permanently keep in 2.0, but with a heavy caveat. See, Skippy's entire allure comes down to that charming AI dropping witty one-liners as we take on the gangs of Night City, but once returned to Regina, Skippy becomes nothing but a shell. An empty vessel, housing no AI at all, so pretty much just a retextured Yukimura. Honestly, not even the puppy-loving pacifist or stone-cold killer mode seem active anymore. So yeah, eventually a free Yukimura, albeit one one that can't be modded. But before that, Skippy is so much more. Found down an alley in Vista del Rey, Skippy was left for dead alongside its owner. And once we pick him up, we'll have to choose between puppy-loving pacifist and stone-cold killer. Choose pacifist first, else it'll stick you with that mode later, but doing it this way will instead get the option to choose if we're sticking with pacifist or switching to killer. Honestly, enjoy your time with AI Skippy whilst it lasts. Enjoy the one-liners. Take him on tour, introduce him to Delamain, let him screw up any attempts at stealth you make, because much as Skippy can be a pain like this, I think it's kind of endearing. And the fact that we now get returned his empty vessel is almost in a way sad. I don't know, it feels like running around firing a corpse. Which is a shame, since remembering Skippy is really the only reason to use it after this. Big marks for creativity on the whole, but I've decided the gun itself really doesn't perform well enough to rank that high. You know the Tektronica weapons that land in airdrops around Dogtown? They set enemies alight in a blaze that doesn't burn by itself, but does afford more damage if you continue to shoot at burning foes. Well, turns out that Padre has been sitting on that technology for years already with his Liberty variant Seraph, which he'll gift you after completing all of his Haywood gigs, the best lineup in the game, before Phantom Liberty at least, which you can learn all about right here. As for the gun, its base damage actually beats all the other Liberties, though it's still definitely isn't the best for reasons we'll come to, though it still ain't a bad contender in the grand scheme of pistols, and it's decent enough even without the burning ability. But there's better base pistols out there, so let's just focus on the burning. Ideally, it's best used against bosses and skull level enemies, especially in later game, since they'll be the big bullet sponges who'll feel that extra damage over time. Against larger hordes, I found it wasn't particularly adding much, but maybe keep this one by for the smaller but strong groups. The burn effect isn't quite as advanced as Tektronica weapons, in that it doesn't seem to stack with each enemy burning, but still, it's a cool connection I picked up on taking another look at this gun. And it's interesting to see that Padre had himself a piece of tech that got banned due to humanitarian concerns, though it definitely fits his character. Ambition is a shorter variant of the Kenshin, which pretty much bears the exact same stats, but comes with the unique ability to upload reboot optics about 15% of the time, blinding opponents and granting a huge boost to headshot damage to anybody blinded. A very creative addition for Phantom Liberty, not to mention a sweet Lord of the Rings reference. Quick spoiler warning for the gig prototype in the scraper, but basically, if you choose to help Hassan out, I let him go but only after giving up the eye, he'll later contact you with a reward that being this very pistol of Hassan's own design. In total, the guy forged 20. Three were given to Mr. Hans, faceless, wisest, and fairest of all fixers. Seven to the stadium vendors, great businessmen and procurers of black market goods. And nine, nine rings with uh, guns were given to the soldiers of Bargast, who above all else, desire power, but they were all of them deceived. For another ambition was made. In the land of Dogtown, in the fires of Longshore Stacks, yeah, that's about all I've got. V was given the one ambition to rule them all, basically. The blinding effect, I suppose, emulates the ring bearer turning invisible, kind of. And Lord of the Rings or not, it's a decent and very unique gun.
Pariah, another word for outcast and the signature gun of our very own Solomon Reed. It's no wonder that Solomon would favour the older, more reliable Tikon over something flashy and new like the Omaha saying. Much like a spy, the gun appears to be a regular Tikon on the outside, but start to use it and you'll realise that it's been miraculously modified to now be silenced. And as a tech pistol with a single powerful charged shot, this makes it a pretty decent bet for stealth. Too bad we can only acquire it once all the Phantom Libertying is complete. Quick spoilers for the end of the expansion, jump to the next timestamp now if that's an issue, but Pariah can only be acquired through first siding with Songbird during Firestarter, then when approaching the space shuttle, we will have to kill Solomon Reed to allow Somi passage to the moon. That's when he'll drop his gun for us to coldly loot. Not nearly as cool as the Erebus SMG you get from the other path I'd say, and not the best stealth pistol in the game, but it is essentially all the good things about the Tikon, plus it can work in stealth, so overall still great, just don't pick that ending purely for this. Dying Knight is literally unrecognisable in 2.0, and you know what, I'm a big fan. We didn't lose the old skin, that went to the X Mod 2, and this one is just more unique. I mean, a bayonet of sorts at the end of a pistol, it's cool. I don't think it does anything, but there we go, still cool. Very easy to acquire of course, just retrieve it when Wilson hollers as we're leaving the apartment block for the first time. It does behave very similar to the standard Lexington, albeit with reduced range and improved handling. That's an important change here, because the way this one works is by by offering increased damage, but only whilst firing moving shots, i.e. you always want to be shuffling around as you aim and fire. Personally, I push towards the enemies usually, as it's the most easy way to remain accurate, but it doesn't matter either way. Of course, this one encourages you to be more up close and personal anyway, so targets should be easier to hit. On top of this, it also administers shock when pummeling enemies with rapid fire, giving it another edge over the standard model. But again, I will stress, it's fairly close with the X mod two models, so give that a try as well and see which you prefer. To be honest, unless you're specced into a fairly tough, health regening armoured build with this one, you might actually struggle to get into the thick of the fight and use it to its full advantage. Still, it's available early and it's free. Oof, this one got nerfed in 2.0, but don't get me wrong, it's still pretty decent when you actually use it, firing in a double burst now with some exceptional handling which is seriously noticeable over the regular newer, but Death and Taxes now comes with a pretty, well a very annoying debuff, the Taxes part. Every shot from this gun, that's every shot not every hit, will tax us about 30 health, or maybe like 5%, and as you can imagine, just like Taxes, it's really annoying. Fortunately, you can't quite be taxed to death, and it will actually cap off around 20% health and not deduct anymore. But still, when you're being shot at, getting to that low health just by shooting back is not a good survival tactic. Now I had a high armour, high regen build here and didn't suffer too badly from this to be fair, and in fact after a while the tax element does instead begin to apply poison to your enemies, which is a nice little bonus. But overall, the fact that this gun has a genuine negative element now is a little off putting, which is a shame because the double shot nature of this gun made it an excellent option for stealth, even if we are only technically firing 5 times per mac. To be honest, it's still a pretty good option there, just as it was in 1.6. I mean, stealth is probably the best time to be losing health like this, but the thing is, there are just better stealth pistols in the game now that don't dock you health, regardless of how well this one handles. Still, I guess it looks cool, Maiko clearly had a good taste in guns, and you can swipe this one from her when we visit with Judy at Clouds or later from Judy's apartments if you miss it the first time. Just a shame that we can't put down some of the shots as business expenses and maybe save a bit more health that way. I don't know, maybe there's an accountant we can speak to? I mean, I'm sure Mr. Hands knows someone. When I compared the stats between Crime Stopper and the regular Kappa, it was surprising to see Crime Stopper improved across the board. It was faster, more accurate, more damaging, and to top it all off, comes with the chance to upload cripple movements onto enemies with every hit. I believe it's an 8% chance for regulars and 1% for bosses, though for max tack it was definitely more than 1%. And though it works in my bare bones chrome compressor build, it probably slots more nicely into something with quick hacks, given how it's bolstering your loadout there essentially. 
easily my go-to capper, and certainly one of the most useful unique features for a gun to have. Flashy damage boosts are all well and good, but immobilizing enemies gives a whole nother edge in battle. To get this one then, you'll first have to reach Georgina Zembinski's room during the gig Heaviest of Hearts. Before you head inside and talk to her, be sure to loot this suitcase just here containing her Crime Stopper. Trust the DA to carry a weapon that can literally stop criminals dead in their tracks. Creatively placed, and considering it's not technically introducing any new mechanics, creatively designed too. Only drawback really is the reduction from 30 rounds to 20. Yeah, this thing needs to reload, like, a lot. So much so that it's a quite noticeable negative, but still far outweighed by the benefits. You know that special card in Gwent that burns an entire row? Now it's a gun too. Who would have thunk? Scorch can be grabbed from V's stash for anyone who's registered both Gwent and Phantom Liberty via GOG. Something I would highly recommend doing as this one has an incredibly satisfying ability. Identical in stats to the t except with an added 20% burn chance. That's per projectile, so 60% on a charged shot. Now, once you have an enemy burning, any further shots that hit them will be immediately magically replenished in the magazine with this cool clinking gold sound. This actually saves so much ammo and practically doubles the time until you have to reload. It also goes further in vehicle combat and is one of my favourite to use there. Easily the best of the T-Cons in my opinion and by far the simplest to get hold of. Kind of. Additionally, the insignia on the back has changed to the Gwent logo and the artwork is all Witcher 2. That's a win for Witcher fans and people who hate reloading. Cheetah is one of the two Unity variants introduced in Phantom Liberty, which heavily encourages a very up-close and personal style of gunplay, buffing both crit and bleed chance higher and higher the closer you are to an enemy, up to about 33% I believe at point-blank range. This comes with a 50% crit damage boost as well, and a hefty 122.5 torso damage, which doesn't quite outpace the headshot multiplier, but basically means it doesn't much matter where you hit with this one, which is nice since firing upwards at super close range is a little bit harder. Basically, it's a brutally violent gut shotgun and most viable in a build with a lot of armor and body perks surviving in the thick of the fight. Nice that it's completely the opposite of the other Unity iconic, Her Majesty. Now, this brutality was previously practiced by an animals gang leader named Angie, whom we'll meet during the No Easy Way Out side quest. Now, spoiler alert, but the only way to get the gun from her is off of her cold, dead corpse. An action that does have however come with some pretty terrible story implications. Check out the second chapter of my worst Phantom Liberty decisions video for more details on that, but in a nutshell, it's a choice between saving the life of Aaron or getting the pistol. And after fully experiencing just how good Cheetah is, that's a tougher choice than I've previously given credit to. Once Skippy is gone, the only Yukimura really worth having is the easy to acquire Genjiro, found during the Devil Ending when we visit the Arasaka residence, but also acquirable upon any random visitation there throughout the game. It's better in literally every way. Speedier, longer range, faster lock-on, not to mention firing in bursts of 4 rather than 3, with an increased ammo count from 30 to 40 to account for that. And I mean, have you seen the targeting area on this thing? It's wider than my bloody monitor setup, and the ability to target get four enemies at once means this actually makes a huge difference. Now, you might assume that taking this more splash damage stance would mean splitting your overall damage, and yes, you would be correct, but overall, especially fighting larger groups, I'd say it's more of a net positive. Consider the gun's 20% shock chance too, and then if you also have vulnerability analytics say, then this precipitates a non-stop cacophony of electrical explosions. Chaotic, sure, but highly effective. It's no wonder that this thing was the defense sidearm of whoever occupies this Arasaka office. Perhaps you're an Obu's superior replacement after we already swiped Kongu. And the name itself, Genjiro, is also a secondary alias of Sanada Yukimura, a 16th to 17th century Japanese warlord for whom the original of these guns is named. Ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Silverhand's Malorian Arms 3516, a gun which fell into the hands of Jeremiah Grayson by 2077 until we took it back during chipping in. Not yours, I don't think. 
So, first things first, nothing is beating this gun in terms of pure Rockaboy style. Everything from the design, the wick flick reload animation, the noise, and the fact its quick melee attack shoots literal fire are all brilliantly stylistic elements of this gun. And feeling like a badass, the same as Johnny Silverhand clearly does in the flashback sequences, is indeed the reason to use this gun. The only reason, really. Other than that, the Malorian is actually pretty slow to use. It boasts an insanely high weapon handling, but the lack of any kind customization makes it a slight pain to aim. Not that I'd want to do anything to change this beautiful gun of course, but versus an iconic Nui with special abilities, style is really the only way the Malorian is winning that. I mentioned the fire breathing quick melee, and yeah that's a really cool feature, but it does drain the entire mag, and doesn't deal nearly enough damage to be worth it. The only economical way to use that attack in fact is by counting your shots, and only meleeing when there's one left. As of 2.0 it also no longer penetrates cover, but it can ricochet, which is a nice passive bonus more than anything, since ricochet shots are fairly weak. Also, I get why we can't attach a silencer for stealth, that wasn't Johnny's style, but stealth really is the quickest and cleanest way to use pistols, making this a tougher way to play in open combat than many other weapons. Do I still love it? Absolutely, I love it so much I still included it in the top 10. As a roleplay gun, it's fantastic, and as the weapon we also use in Arasaka Tower 3D, it's, in that game, really good. And yeah, it's a shame not being as powerful as it is in the flashbacks, but I suppose that in a way accentuates the overly heroic character that Johnny sees himself as in those memories, far more powerful than he actually was. It works, and in fairness they did buff it in the last patch to sit alongside the other pistols fairly well. Just don't assume it's the Arendite Sword of Cyberpunk, because it's not. It's just cool, really. Now, this is one I've often called the Wabberjack of Cyberpunk 2077, and it can be acquired as early as the pickup, but only provided that Royce somehow dies. Whether that be you side with Militech and kill him yourself, locking us out of the Doom Doom Revolver later, or just side with Maelstrom and make sure to let him die in the ensuing battle. That will still allow you to get Doom Doom, but will instead lock you out of Sir John Falastiff. Either way, this gun just hinges on Royce's death. The reason I call it the Wabberjack is due to its nature of re-rolling its damage damage type, chance to apply said elemental damage, and its crit chance with each reload. Good luck, the description says. And yeah, whilst this hinges a bit on luck, that'll average out across fights. The reason I like this gun is more due to how we can experience bleed, burn, shock and poison all with the same weapon. Kind of like we're cycling guns, except we're not, and those status effect chances tend to be pretty high. In fact, if you really want a good head start at the beginning of a fight, you can manually cycle and check the effect until you get a good one before entering the fight, though that's a bit overkill if you ask me. Mostly this is just a good one with which to have fun. Risk It is a bold looking newer for a bold journalist, Bree Whitney, whom we work for during the Shot by Both Sides quest, the various endings for which I went over in greater detail in my previous video, but basically whatever ending you choose you should be able to acquire this gun, so keep an eye out for it. It's not quite as powerful as La Chingona Dorada, but does boast higher handling and a 50% higher headshot multiplier, so kind of more damaging if you're accurate. And across the board it is superior to the regular newer, but really kind comes into its own once you start to hit low health. Again, kind of an annoyingly risky feature to try and take advantage of on very hard, but still a nice last stand sort of thing to have. At 40% health, weapon recoil will disappear, and at 25% all hits will be critical. Decent things to have, especially when fighting off against hordes of police and max tack, and it's a seriously close call between this one and Lachingona for the best newer now. Honestly, I think it's gotta come down to personal preference. Do you prefer to set people on fire, or unlock special abilities when teetering on the brink of death and only then. Then there's also the fact that this one belonged to a journalist we met for 5 minutes, whereas the other belonged to our best friend. So comment below if you disagree with this ordering and think that they should switch. If there weren't already enough reasons to send Jackie to Mama Wells, then here's another one. Or rather, another two. Lachingona Dorada are the two golden Nui variants used by Jackie during the prologue, and now they are the most powerful variants of the Nui we can own. I say they because there are two of them, but realistically we can only use one, so maybe let the other rest with Jackie like some friendship bracelet sort of thing, though you'll definitely want to be using this. It has two main abilities. Firstly, landing headshots will subsequently increase the 
the gun's burn chance and critical damage, pairing nicely, in a way, with Seraph and giving all these Valentino guns a fiery theme. But also, quite usefully, especially if you switch weapons a lot, this one will restore for free to the magazine any bullets that landed headshots when you cycle off the gun and then back. Basically, it's the submachine fun perk, but you need to land headshots for it to work. Nice to have, but unless you get into the methodology of counting headshots and switching rather than reloading, not the most amazing thing in the world. What is amazing though is the level of raw damage we can obtain here. Whack a silencer on this thing and you have a stealth weapon to rival her majesty or pride, which can be acquired much earlier than those two guns. Still, the burn effects and the fact that these were jackies suggest that these were more designed to be used in open combat, where they still perform excellently. Though nothing is quite as quick or clean as stealth one-shot pistoling. With the Chow being my favourite smart pistol in the game, it's unsurprising that I was pretty happy to pick up this during Phantom Liberty. Ogu is looted off of the robot boss in the Treating Symptoms gig and is a less tactical but more obliteration oriented version of the gun that specialises in dismemberments. With increased damage but reduced range, still very good though, and most notably a burst of two rather than three. It feels a bit weird at first, this change, arguably less satisfying to fire, but after a while it became clear that this gun was superior, especially with the bonuses afforded across larger fights. See, with every dismemberment, which is pretty much guaranteed on every enemy with this gun, you'll gain a buff to both crit and bleed chance, stacking after 5 times to 50% more. Couple that with the standard 50% increase in crit damage, and you've got a weapon that absolutely shreds through anything after the first few kills. Pistols really aren't an optimal gun to take on max tack compared to weapons like katanas, but with this one, I was actually able to take them down on very hard, a bit, with a lot of dashing and a very well specced build. Still, more than can be said for most of this list. Smart guns are generally weaker weapons to balance them out, but among those ranks, this is the strongest per shot, and it therefore makes sense why they reduced the burst from triple to double, imposing a fairly necessary nerf. Basically, it's a more violent voodoo boy chow. I think it's time Lexington and Dying Knight moved over, because man, there's a new best full auto pistol now. At least, I think so. Meet Rook, a gun acquired from Slider's stash at the Dogtown Needle. To get the code properly, you'll have to keep listening to the Cassell twins when hacked into their car until they discuss the code. But if you just so happen to know it, or randomly attempt Morgan Blackhand's high score from the Arasaka Tower 3D arcade game, the cache will open up, and this pistol will be inside. It's equipped, interestingly, with one of the longer range scopes even though they don't generally attach to pistols, as well as a silencer. Neither can be unequipped, so clearly this is oriented for slightly longer range stealth. It's not a one-shot headshotter like others on the list, but while slightly less efficient, it is arguably more fun. With 30 rounds in the magazine and firing more rapidly than any other Lexington, this can take down enemies still quick enough to avoid detection. Aided by the 50% crit damage boost, and aided by the cool effects granted from successive on-target shots. Each hit to an enemy increases crit chance by 10% all the way up to 100, but also increases recoil. Hence the keep her steady in the description, because missing just one will reset the effect. Basically, it's a gun that continually aggregates in damage outputs as you lay in successful rapid fire. Very creative, very fun, and surprisingly excellent in stealth, even against skull level enemies. It may eat through ammo like it's nobody's business, but hopefully by remaining in stealth, you can easily craft more whenever. And to be fair, even out of stealth, that buildup of damage effect still works just fine. Sure, there's better open combat guns out there, but this is a strong and enjoyable contender. Easily one of the most underrated guns in the game, and I love it. So, Lizzie was a piece of utter brilliant insanity in 1.6, and Lizzie is a piece of utter brilliant insanity still. Very easy to acquire, just pick it up from this table at Lizzie's once the quest Automatic Love has started, and it'll be yours to use and upgrade as you choose. Whilst the Omaha was already the king of tech pistols, Lizzie takes that design and improves it significantly, shooting out four projectiles per shot instead of three, which we can just about see against this wall. But more importantly, when fully charged, Lizzie 
fires in bursts of five. And whilst yes, this has a little bit of upwards recoil, it is on the whole still very accurate. Gone sadly is the thing's burn effect, but they were kind enough to up the ammo count from 10 to 15, basically allowing for a third charged shot before reloading. I expected big things from Lizzie before using it again, and man, I wasn't disappointed. It still essentially feels like firing a mid-range burst shotgun, just without the knockback. And in fact, with the reduction in range from the Omaha, like a shotgun, hell, with shotguns is not a bad means by which to use this gun. The gun I definitely used the most through my first run of Phantom Liberty is easily the one given to us by Alex. Her Majesty is so much more than just a Unity variant, it is arguably the best stealth gun in the game now. Arguably. Powerful, already automatically silenced, and getting buffed even further when used in tandem with optical camo. It's a one-shot headshot on all enemies, but for bosses and the skull level ones. Far quicker, far cleaner, and far less ammo intensive than possibly any other pistol, I'd say. It's acquired for free during the main campaign, so what more could you ask for? Well, maybe one thing. See, the best benefits of this gun, as I said, come from when optical camo is active, guaranteed crits, and no spread whatsoever. But optical camo has a fairly long cooldown when trying to briskly stealth through an area. So basically, this works infinitely better with the Vanishing Act perk, since that automatically triggers optical camo any time we sneak sprints, leading me to adopt this slightly awkward method method of sneak walking towards enemies quickly whilst firing a lined up shot. It takes a little bit of practice and it does have to be a lined up shot from beforehand because when triggering camo we can't actually see the crosshair anymore. Alternatively we could just use hip fire, there's still a crosshair when we do that, but then it's a little bit harder to aim. And in stealth, anything but headshots is not an insta kill and instead probably means detection. So what I'm saying is it kind of feels like the optimum usage of this gun is not entirely possible. So please CDPR, I'm begging you, if you're still doing patches, just maybe add a little dot in the center of the screen with this one to emulate a laser or something. And if this is in fact already a thing and I'm just missing something or my game is bugged, then I'm so sorry. Overall though, still a fantastic stealth gun even without the optical camo features. But yeah, that's the only gripe I have with this one. Other than that, I still love it and really enjoy stealth gameplay. So I know I said Her Majesty was the best stealth gun in the game, and that still holds true, kind of, until you get this one. In fairness, it's kind of unfair putting pride at the top, given you have to essentially complete the game in order to get it, but at the same time, you can complete the sun ending having only played like 30% of the content in a rush, so still plenty of use to be had with this gun. Pride of course was the property of Rogue, and we can pick it up during her ending, after which it will be awarded when returning to the point of no return to be permanently kept, along with her assault rifle, Prejudice. And these two can work hand in hand, with killing an enemy using one, then switching to the other, allowing for no ammo consumption for the first few seconds. Nice to have, but not essential. And Pride stands perfectly strong on its own. Prideful, one might say. It's already a powerful gun in its own right, much more so than most of the other liberties, but it doesn't stop there. This gun has a combination of boosts, which when combined, contribute to the only pistol capable of taking down skull level enemies with one silenced stealth shot. Firstly, 150% headshot multiplier, fairly standard as pistols go, but whilst health is over 3 quarters full, this increases up to an insane 420% for me at one point. Plus an extra boost on top of that against elite enemies as well as 100% boosted crit damage, with every first shot fired from a magazine also being a guaranteed crit. Essentially, camping from afar, especially if you reload between every shot, and having a decent silencer for even more stealth damage, you can pick off enemies one by one, as well as any sniper ever could. And after making this video, it is my go-to pistol, because it's not only great in stealth, but it can also yield exceptional damage in open combat too, provided you stay above 75% health. It's still okay after that, but does fall in with the rest at that point. So maybe if you're getting into fights a lot and taking a lot of damage, use something else. Lizzie say, or Cheetah, if 
your opponents to headshots. But otherwise, for any mid to long range encounters, you absolutely will not beat this, at least as far as pistols are concerned. And even in cars as well, it's an absolute winner and one-shotting machine. It's so good in fact that I've even noted it as a major benefit for choosing the sun ending for when I get to the endings ranked video. I think also originally it was supposed to be a Tsunami Nue, not sure why they changed it as that would have made a lot of sense for a powerful gun, but still, whatever model it's based on, the results speak for themselves. So what are you waiting for? Go play the sun ending and get the number one pistol in the game. You can then do the other endings afterwards whilst wielding this weapon. But comment below if you agree, if something else deserves top spots, or if you think anything on this list is ranked disgustingly low. That was an insanely long ranking, so thank you for sticking around, and I hope it was interesting or helpful. Massive shout out to the patrons, as always, for keeping this channel alive. In fact, I've got big plans for that coming soon, so stay tuned, and thanks for watching. I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you in the next one.